Ladies and gentlemen, this is such a classic. Brings back memories for me. Oh, oh, here it is. It's Thor High Heels. Remember that one? Oh, bitch, you bet I do. The PSP, too. It was a cool system with, like, you know, low times and, and this really sleek, glossy screen and a bunch of games all using the same font for some reason. Like, I believe it was the system font, which was weird. And uh, also a pretty great library of games that all feel like they would have been better off on home consoles. I do love the little shit, though. I have many fond memories of it, and I'm sure many of you do, too. This one time I watched Predator on one while sleeping over at a friend's house and then they did that thing with their big veiny man arms all sweating up like, yeah brother, and I was all like, wow, manly, PSP, I suppose Crisis Core and list of classic games were all pretty great too. Shame we never got those Yakuza games though. So the PSP came out in 2004 and had a pretty good run from then on up until about 2010. Not because it got discontinued then, not at all, but simply because most people just stopped giving a fuck. I brought this up earlier when I talked about Peace Walker. That's a big game from a big series with a big fan base and big sales across the board and yet it tanked like a morbidly obese whale due to it releasing during the 2010s. For real, a lot of classics like Crisis Core, God of War, Loco Roco and GTA whatever were all from the decade prior to it and many of the bigger games that you'd think would have done well or would have come out abroad like Danganronpa, Type Zero, Corpse Party, Tactics Ogre, The Third Birthday and Steins Gate either didn't do well at all, wouldn't even get localized out of fear of them doing that or only did well until after they got ported to other systems. The PSP had become somewhat of a death knell for anything but big certified booty shakers and even then only barely as Peace Walker proved. And so, the weird days of weird little experiments and funky spin-offs a la Metal Gear Acid and Tales of the World were Dede and Dunzo. As the console lived on solely as an easily hacked emulation machine. So I take it that that's why something like Kurohyo Ryugagoku to Shinsho or Yakuza Black Panther, as it likely would have been dubbed as here, stayed in Japan. And I must say that that's gonna go for most games in this video as well, just so I don't have to constantly repeat myself like an asshole. The PSP was just too cursed at this point. But hey, that ain't gonna stop me from diving into this bitch anyway, is goddamn. Yeah, man, just the fact that they used bitmap snapshots of the PS3 Camarocho model for pre-rendered backgrounds speaks to my soul something fierce. As much as I liked the vibe of the newer Yakuza games, there was something extra dingy about the PS2 one, wasn't there? Like, you straight up couldn't see the sky, which just gives it this weirdly otherworldly or dystopian feel. Add to that the fact that they could cramp up the alleyways something fierce due to them not having to compensate for 3D camera movement. As well as just the dirtier, muddier, darker look of PS2 textures in general, and you ended up with one grimy bitch. Which is recreated pretty well here, compressed though it be. Developed by Shin Sophia, aka the Aki Engine people who y'all wrestling fans reportedly get boners over, it is a smaller, quicker, snappier Yakuza game about a hot-headed thug child sporting a haircut that it make even Tekken characters nervous. As a connoisseur of tracksuits also, I can appreciate the vibe for real for real and I also dig how up close, down and dirty mana gets during combat. Thing is, is that because Aki Engine people, the fighting takes a very different approach here than it does in the main games. As rather than traditional beat em up shit, we go on straight boxing game with the jukes, blocks, exhaustion systems, and big fat beady punches that shake the screen with every hit. Shit feels great, even if it is a bit slower. I, I guess to compensate for the lack of free movement, it's a tad more combo focused and slightly more methodical as a result of both. Nothing super deep or intelligent per se, but a fun 
myself monitoring my enemies a lot with them being so up close instead of just being the button mashing storm ram I am in the other games. They're driven to play more with the insights and quick thinking as that of a slow moving tactical jab focused boxer. And again, the feel of that is fucking great. Every hit lands with the impact of a sledgehammer and it also manages some pretty cool effects and finishers that while not as over the top as the mainline heat moves come in pretty strong due to their intimacy. Though combat hasn't really ever been the main draw to the series now has it. It's mostly the crazy side quests that function as small little sub stories with their own arcs, characters and sometimes entire mechanics and also the many mini games that you can do around town that tend to drag people in. And I feared that that's where the main corner cuts it be to fit it onto the PSP and uh, lo and behold. Uh or at least not by the standards set by Yakuza 1 and 2. Like you won't be doing zero level shit here because you weren't doing zero level shit in the console games of this time either. But most enterable buildings are left intact, people approach you with all kinds of shit as well and the mini games are here too. In fact, I really really like how they managed to squeeze these in cause look at this shit. Baseball is an FMV game now and that's goddamn adorable and creative. And for sure it's all a bit quicker and more simplistic, but it fits a game like this. I, I love the side quests in 5, 0 and 6 for instance, but I can't imagine that getting roped into this whole one hour tirade about trying to help a BDSM sex worker find the light of her life while on a 20 minute train ride would be a bit obnoxious. I don't think it really matters either way, as the main plot is quite snappily paced and puts you in a few fun situations of its own. For one, there's this one dude who keeps using English phrases like Okay, no problem! And Do what nobody knows. Which isn't entirely unlike this game called Racing Lagoon. Please fan translate Racing Lagoon! And our main hero is also a bit of a massive fuckhead where Kazuma is all lilies and flowers and pure moral holiness. This dude can shake motherfuckers for ice at the end of fights and gets chased by the cops on the regula and laughs maniacally like a proper villain. This results in him accidentally doing a murder, which then sends him down the usual rabbit hole of bullshit, only without the yeah, but I'm being framed though, and more okay, maybe I had this coming, but also fuck you. It is a neat, more aggressive twist, well suited for this absolute cock knocker of a battle system. System, and overall far faster moving, more simplistically told story. And oh boy, <laughs> someone on the dev team must have really liked portable ops. That aside though, the tone, acting and scoring that the series is known for is maintained and recreated perfectly. Even with me not being able to understand it at all, I was sucked right in. Plus, it's visually quite nice looking and conveys what's going on pretty strongly, as well as tonally, that it's for sure followable even without knowing Japanese. Honestly, it helps that there are a lot of cutscenes. Th this game probably has more fully voiced scenes in it than Zero did, which isn't a fair comparison, I know, but it's still pretty goddamn neat for what is obviously a lower stakes side story in the grand scheme of things. But uh, yeah, it is a Yakuza game through and through. The sound effects, the look of everything, the fonts and menus, it's all there exactly as it be in literally all of them. Consistent, tight, sleek and weirdly satisfying to click through. What's also cool is that Family Guy funny moments did the soundtrack, which means that it has Yakuza butt rock with added scratching, samples and breakbeats. Weirdly making this perhaps my favorite Yakuza OSD outside of the first ones and just Overall, it's pretty goddamn good. Unlike the main games part 3 onward, this one can actually be quite tricky. It has a few of those god hand-esque difficulty brick walls that you cannot cheese climb but need a breakthrough by showing that you know how to play. Which in this case means how to use the dodge parry system effectively. Timing your jukes well enough to get a slowdown which then allows you to fuck shit up breaking their guard. You will not beat up Boxer Boy without it, as he'll juke your every move and stunlock your ass something fierce, so it legit felt really fucking rewarding to fuck him up in the raw kinesthetical sense. In short, it is bite-sized Yakuza. Comparable essentially to what RE Revelations is to third person resi or what portable ops is to mainline MGS. I.e. it has all the bits, just smaller and lower key but with a gimmick that ties it together better. In this case, one hell of a beefy boy battle system that I wouldn't mind seeing revisited at all with like slightly smoother controls because it wouldn't be on the PSP. Shame though that we never got it and that the background layers don't function very well on an emulator. Bruh.
On the upside, I guess we did get a Kenka Buncho game, which is essentially Yakuza's sloppy little brother who no one cares about. Kenka Buncho Battles Rumble is the name, and being reviewed by an awkwardly voiced 2017 me is its game. I liked it a fair bit, even gave a little history lesson about what a Buncho be. What I didn't quite get into though is how this game was part of a long-running series that remained largely in Japan. Started off on the PS2 with what may be the coolest Yonki vibe I think I've ever seen, and the game was also okay. Okay enough to warrant the PS2 sequel at least, but not good enough to prevent itself from being banished to the handheld realm afterwards, where it's been ever since, with even its most recent entries being on the 3DS and Vita. Aside from Badass Bumble though, the PSP saw two more Kenka Buncho games, so I figured I'd dip into the last one real quick to see how much they were able to iterate on the admittedly pretty base at times third game. SPOILER WARNING! They <laughs> barely did. Certainly looks almost exactly like the same game from the outset, like Jesus. Actually, literally unchanged the same. Not even a spice up of the UI or text boxes or nothing. It's pretty blatant. Plays the same too. Same stiffness, same selective bare bonesness. <sighs> I mean, I can hear a large group of people, but uh... Same slightly overt undercurrent of awk, but also the same big dumb beating heart that somehow makes it a joy to fumble through. I just love how in this series a quick scene of some kids talking is paired with... <laughs> like, this man does not deserve this score. Though the clothing options are once again fucking exquisite, and maybe even a bit better, and the town looks super cool too, and is a bit less samey than the Bumble one. So shit's good. Good effort milking too. I'd, I'd rather see a couple of copy-pasted sequels that just give you more of the same, rather than this studio going bankrupt not being able to achieve their lofty ambitions. Be small to get big later. I uh, guess I can say the same for the PSP EDF games too, as <laughs> This is also just the EDF game. You shoot bug, get bigger gun, shoot more bug. The UI, the look, the feel is all more or less identical to the PS2, 3 and 4 efforts, if not a bit more basic, but pretty cool for what it is still. Also, given how it ran on far more powerful hardware, it's surprising to see how well this holds up on the Babby PlayStation. And I mean, I've never actually played an EDF game before. I've seen them played many times. I know what they do, but man, this shit's fun as fuck. It's just pure chaos control, only you control it with more chaos. The music's bombastic, the ants are legit kinda scary just due to how skitterish they move about, suddenly skirting towards you at breakneck speed, and when they do get to you, you get fucking yeeted, boy! boy, boy, boy. Guns are loud as fuck, and just the absolute destructive cacophony of it all is honestly quite amazing. I know these games tend to have like a billion levels and guns and modes as well, and I, I don't have time for that now, but I really would not mind digging into this series proper at some point, because this shit was fucking incredible. You know how sometimes on Twitter you'll get those chain posts, like Top 5 Favorite Bra Moments, Tech Your Friends. I usually tend to ignore those, but as it's go, it's hard to resist a good Devin from time to time. Well, Potato on YouTube, please subscribe. And so I got caught up in one of those Top 5 Fave Game tweets. Below though, someone asked what our favorite Hidden Jemmy games would be, and I quite boldly put Raw Danger at number one. Because, man, goddamn, I cannot stop thinking about that piece of shit. If you don't know, it's a sequel to Disaster Report. Also quite the neat little game in its own right, but a bit of a meme and also maybe just that smallest smidge too low budge for its own good, if only because it gets in the way of its ambitions a lot. But in the somehow far lesser known and appreciated sequel, they go hard in on those ambitions. You got mini open worldy bits, various campaigns with a drama driven plot that goes all over the place, tons of different locales that'll all dramatically be destroyed in real time, Cool characters for days and voice acting and writing that, while hokey in a fitting way, is actually pretty darn good. It's easily one of my favorite PS2 games of all time, even if the frame rate sometimes dips well below 10. Because it has heart. It has soul. And I am beyond excited for Disaster Report 4 coming out later this year. Hold up. 
Why is it go disaster report? Raw Danger Disaster Report 4. Ah, because you see, the third game never came out abroad. Why? I don't know, who fucking gives a shit? Some people try to fan translate it, but the thread has since been nuked and all evidence of it, aside from its skeleton, been deleted. So, I think that just going in raw is the only way to face this danger. Uh-oh! Fire Tornado! Luckily, you were anime boy and girl who can survive all gameplay their way past the urban wreckages left in its wake. You know, like, find items, use them elsewhere, survival horror-style level setups as a result, cool real-time set pieces where you press your shoulder to brace with quick timing lest you get your ass dunked on, great atmosphere and sense of scale and quiet before the storm shit despite a clearly lower budget. And of course, also, tons of wacky findable costumes, characters and compasses. Everything from the past two games is here. Except for the body gauge and moist bar, respectively, as they've been replaced by a stress meter. Whether if it's breathing in smoke, finding corpses, having to run the fuck away, and a variety of other forms of peril, it'll increase your stress bar, which will then impede your health bar. And having a wee chill or pill will then inch it back down again. Honestly, as corny as it might sound, the gameplay is just fun. Simple problem solving, jerky but tense platforming, over the top set pieces, nice quiet cinematic and exploration segments with big huge variety and buildings to waltz into. It feels scavengy but not in that cheapo gamey crafting system sort of way. It feels awkward, but not in a manner that's hindering, but in a way that kind of makes it feel more like you're actually stuck in tight shit and don't know what to do with yourself. Besides, elements that sucked in its brethren, like the occasional inventory management or the constantly draining bars have all been dealt with or simped. Overall, it's just a smooth ass game to play, yet it never feels easy or handholdy, even when it goes so far as to brightly highlight all items and distinguish which are the essentials with colors. It mainly achieves this balance by you never not knowing what finna happen. Nature can strike at any time, of course, and so I never feel safe. And so I never felt safe or prepared, even in the game's most chillest, cutest moments. Which makes shit gripping and seat edging without things ever being exhausting or unfair. Raw Danger didn't make the top of my hidden gem lists for nothing, trust me. What's cool about this one, and is something Raw Danger also tried to do more of, is that it gets into the horrors of disasters a bit more. Like, this will definitely always be a series that doesn't take itself too seriously, and that's great, but I think when that humor gets contrasted with more real shit, it can become more potent. I mean, the first game is good, but a bit of a meme. The second had tons of heart and soul with actual characters, but wasn't ever dark per se. But this one... This one starts off with a bus full of children getting toppled as you crawl out as the lone survivor in betwixt a bunch of kitty corpses. Using the first person crawls of games past to really put you on in there in a special way as well. Of course, this is then followed by you finding this funny clown compass! But either way, it does a really great job by making you feel the anxiety and severity of a disaster through how it balances these more imperfect human moments with the full-on crushing realities of being a small group of survivors in a wholly totaled city. You see folks giving up, entire streets and infrastructure smashed, buildings stipped, but yet you also form bonds, share memes, and trying your darndest to look as cool as your nerd ass possibly can. It's shit like that that makes this series feel so much more grounded and human than any self-serious disaster movie or game I've ever seen be. People just aren't that dramatic, and they don't whisper all the time. And things like insecurity, humor, or horny won't suddenly disappear just because an earthquake happened. Or, uh, I mean, you know, there's a time and place for everything, but this series knows the times and has the places. And Disaster 3 is no exception.
Not gonna lie though, there is some very oblique PS penis in this game for real for real. Car drive away, wheels don't move, tree, images, fuck you, camera, the fuck is a camera. And the disasterness of the crazy sequences has been pushed back a little bit too. The first game, for example, had whole roads with vehicles and shit toppling over in front of you. The second had all kinds of crazy water stuff. And while this one does have fire tornado, it also has... Oh no, random falling cars. It's a bit more simplistic and less real-timey, which hurts the feel of it a tad. Now, of course, I know that PSP go on PSP, and that while on the whole, this is actually all pretty impressive. I mean, even Big Money Square came out swinging with the obvious hallways in Crisis Core, and this game does have far more realistic feeling infrastructure and geometry, it's just... This game, like any PSP game, is vibing on a much smaller scale, which isn't exactly ideal for a series about big scale. However, on the flip, it does run at a blazing clip as a result. As stated, it has that classic quiet time x crazy balance what the others two do too, but it dilly dallies around far less and doesn't pull any backtracking out of its ass either. It's far more go go go, race to the end, urgent one might say, which does then add to the scale given that you have far less time to linger on the lack of it. Also a perk of its shorter nature, while I loved how massive Rod Danger was with its many plot lines and crazy reveals and batshit side stories and people, some of its stronger moments were the smaller one-on-one -on -one romantic and or bondage homey bits. And three focuses primarily on these two, sticking together through thick and thicker and getting to know each other quite well over time. Obviously and sadly, I can only gleam so much, but all dialogue is voiced and I can actually understand enough basic snippets of Japanese verbally to be able to piece things together enough, with of course the tone of speech in chewing a lot of well to where I was still able to get into and feel the vibes, and the vibes felt nice. Plus, it has this epic murder mystery side to it too, and a few wee side stories of its own to the folks you bump into which are pretty excellent for keeping up the pace too. Overall, it's a pretty powerful little game that perfectly carries over the charm and heart that the other two had for sure. If there's one thing the PSP was known for, it's JRPGs. I could list them all, but fuck that, here's a list of snapshots from a website that did just that. Shit's good though. Can't say that any of these rank among my faves, but some are defo scraping the top of the top 10. Or is, is that the bottom? Is, is the 10... Is, is the 10 the top or bottom of a top 10? Leave a comment down below! But yeah, with such a shitstorm of shit, it only makes sense some wouldn't stick or stay behind. Like a Zill Ol. You know, people dunk on JRPG names, but usually they're just being ignorant towards what those titles mean or how cool they look typographically. Like Ease just looks great with the right font. Kingdom Hearts 358 over two days explains the basic concept of the game in a creative way, but Zill all or all uh, uh, just oh boy. <laughs> game though, fucking ugly. <laughs> really mediocre gameplay also. I can see why this never was even considered for localization. There's also Nayuta no Kiseki, which seemed to me like one of those trail mix titles based off of the box art. And there's also a handful of those Tales of the World dungeon crawler games, one of which did make it over and is pretty neato. Sadly, JRPGs are hard to cover for vids like these and I really only brought them up because I wanted to say Zill all out loud at least a few times and because they important PSP shit. Made up over half of its library pretty much, while the other half was taken up by something else that the PSP would also quickly gain a lot of notoriety for too. Just not so much in the West, weirdly enough. I am, of course, talking about the Big Horn. Japan has many corner shops, 7-Elevens, convenience stores, whatever you want to call them. And at these, aside from somehow really great food, they also used to have these Wii stands with PSP games. Though these wouldn't be your average PSP games, nay, these would be dating sims. Acres upon acres of dating sims. Date samurai boy. Date girl of questionable age. Feed girl banana. Date girl of questionable age. Be fat date boy. And uh... 
dude, what the fuck? There's many of these, to say the least, and they also sold quite well because cheap and teenage boys and girls and potentially creepo adults can all partake in and relate to the high school horny alike. In fact, these shit sold so well that I honestly feel that these motherfuckers tainted the remaining middle market of Japan's games industry during the late 2000s and early 10s. For instance, Tamsoft and D3 Publisher going from fun and varied low-budget trash to putting out nothing but titty games in the form of the Senran Kagura series. Or Suda51 being forced to shove in the infamous gigolo mode into Killer is Dead at the demand of his Japanese publisher. Square also dropped Lightning Returns, aka a pretty princess dress em up, lollipop chainsaw, fire emblem started doing dating shit, Akiba's trip, corpse party, book of shadow was far hornier than the original ever was, and the same goes for Danganronpa 2 in comparison to the first one. The rise of horny PSP games being some of the only non-mobile titles that sold big happening in the late zeros, and the inclusion of the big horny in all middle market AA Japanese games during the early 2010s, when that market looked doomed for dead for death seems to me like a pretty clear correlation. That is, of course, until U4 and Unity got big and indie started happening and publishing and production costs lowered for a new gen of HD consoles and boom, we're back where we are today with shit getting better every year. But it's still hard to deny how Japan certainly entered a bit of a horny dark age. <sighs> Man. <laughs> Omi just gives zero shits, doesn't he? Boku no Natsuyasumi is a series I've spoken about before, here and here. And it's about summer vacay, i.e. just lazing about in a small town as a kid. Going fishing, biking, swinging, chilling and mild mischief adventuring. All the shit you might have done as a kid too, as I certainly did, hence why the first game on PS1 resonated with me to quite the exceptional degree. And the spin-off on 3DS which focused more on childlike wonder and imagination was really cool too. It is a decently large series though, with a second entry on PS2 and a third on PS3 and a fourth on PSP. And while I will no doubt get to the other two at some point too, you don't have to be a genius to figure out which one I'm going to be talking about here. The PS1 one, at least for a bit more. Cause you see, that video that I covered that in had this deep dive theme in which I dove into the depths of Japan only PS1 games in the hopes to find something that I could fully appreciate language barrier be damned. And the boy Boku wasn't heavy on dialogue, and when it was, it was fully voiced, well animated and simplistically and intuitively situationed. And as a game, it wouldn't ever demand much from you either, few mini puzzles aside, as generally, it was actually just a game about day-to-day -day summer life. And so, it was that game, i.e. that bitch. And with this, I wondered, is the PSP game similar? Yeah, shit's great. Same vibes, same chill, same hangout and stumble into adventure shit. This time you aren't in the ruralest of rurals, but instead in a small beachside town. With the brightest blue hues, palm trees and exceptionally strong doors open vibes. Like, fuck distinctions between outside and inside, we summer vibin'. Anyway, the more urban locale brings with it some shits what the first game didn't have. You can buy stuff from your neighbor homie shop man, for instance. There's also far more characters and local kids to hang with. And rather than cicadas, birds and winds, you get humming electrical wiring, distant TVs and radios and boats. You can also go swimming now, which I believe the second game introduced, as well as the bike riding, and there's far more things to do overall. And all of it just feels pretty darn great to do, too. The way your bike rides out as you stop spinning the paddle, or how the game intuitively uses the very mild puzzle items for you, this not having to menu, how long days last, and the pacing overall, and just... Even the basic movement is all super smooth, despite either the PSP D-pad or the tankies, simply through how easygoing the vibe is overall. Like, the mini games are immediately intuitive and straightforward for sure, but because the story and setting frames everything so well, even the most minorest finds, like a bug underneath a plank of wood, start feeling like epic rewards. Che! 
Shit's engaging, not really through any inherent systems or mechanics, but just through the context everything exists in. And I think that that's super interesting, and something that goes underappreciated in games like Animal Crossing or certain narrative-driven titles too. Overall though, this series is just a big zen zone for me. It, it just yanks me in to the point of forgetting what time of day it actually is, being wholly immersed in the glowy, warm, sunsetty vibes, only to then look outside after playing and see that it's shitty grey because of shitty winter and shitty stupid rain and clouds. But man, it is strong. The exploration is actually really fun due to how drop that gorgeous everything looks and how impossibly nice shit sounds. Every corner houses a sight to behold and a frame that you will be unlikely to forget. Add to that the many events spoken around those very same corners taking place in those very same frames and you end up with a potent combo of making a fuck whole lot of something out of doing nothing. It is purified, concentrated, and contained childhood adventure energy, unlike the likes of which I have never seen. Shit honestly makes me feel nostalgic despite not having had any association with this series until less than a year ago. It, it, it's like playing Animal Crossing with friends on the DS outside in the scorching sun. It's climbing a tree or looking for bottle caps or seashells on the beach. It is pure, powerful, and is honestly quickly becoming one of my favorite series ever. And with that, I leave you with this. Uh, a game called Portable Island about, well, exploring a portable island. What's weird though, as you can see, is that it looks more like a PS1 game, don't it? The grainy ass textures that look like plastered on pixel art. It's like a PS1 Jurassic Park Traspasser, no boobies, less jank edition. In fact, I do wonder if the devs making this felt the same way about jungle settings as I do. Being that the jungle Shonen Crash, Tomb Raider, that one Congo game or any other early 3D jungle feel almost extra jungle. The jaggies mushing the textures grouped close together into one another as the sky is either black or non-visible, as everything in the distance turns to unidentifiable pixel clutter with the details up close only sticking out more due to the lower detail of the rest of it all. Not to mention that the more linear level designs of older titles would result in those dense walls of grainy forestation trapping one inside. I just feel like I need a goddamn machete just looking at it, you know? It's basically like what VHS artifacting does for dark horror, low poly, low texture does for jungle. And I, I don't really have much more of a point otherwise, but I just think that that's neat. As for the actual game at hand though, it's a type of mist style game, I think. Honestly, I don't know. It's weird. But, but a vibe for sure. I, I mostly just brought it up because it looked cool and because I wanted to do my little jungle spiel that'll no doubt flesh itself out into a full script at some point. Either way though, PSP, good. Better when emulated even. Has strong Y2K associations too and a pretty cool library despite some potential classics being left abroad. And with that, I leave you with this.